My name is Aram, and welcome to the storytelling podcast of Now and Then. My goal with this show is to transform fictional stories about the past, present, and future into audio dramas with rich music, voiceovers, and sound effects. Some of these tales will be short stories with a single narrator. Others will be full novels broken into episodes with guest vocal talent from the Chicago area. If you would like to support the show, head on over to ofnowandthen.com where I've got links to our Patreon account and official t-shirts. For those of you joining us for my other podcast, an original fantasy story told by playing, recording, and heavily editing a Dungeons & Dragons game called God's Fall, I think you'll enjoy the tales I've selected for season one. If any of you have suggestions for future stories, please do not hesitate to contact me on Twitter at of now and then. And with that out of the way, let's get on with the show. The Machine Stops by E.M. Forrester, published in 1909. Chapter One, The Airship. Imagine, if you can, a small room, hexagonal in shape, like the cell of a bee. It is lighted neither by window nor by lamp, yet is filled with a soft radiance. There are no apertures for ventilation, yet the air is fresh. There are no musical instruments, and yet, at the moment that my meditation opens, this room is throbbing with melodious sounds. An armchair is in the center, by its side a reading desk. That is all the furniture. And in the armchair there sits a swaddled lump of flesh. A woman, about five feet high, with a face as white as fungus. It is to her that the little room belongs. An electric bell rang. The woman touched a switch and the music was silent. I suppose I must see who it is she thought, and set her chair in motion. The chair, like the music, was worked by machinery and it rolled her to the other side of the room where the bell still rang importunately. Who is it? she called. Her voice was irritable, for she had been interrupted often since the music began. She knew several thousand people. In certain directions, human intercourse had advanced enormously. But when she listened into the receiver, her white face wrinkled into smiles, and she said, Very well, let us talk. I will isolate myself. I do not expect anything important will happen for the next five minutes, for I can give you fully five minutes, Kuno. Then I must deliver my lecture on music during the Australian period. She touched the isolation knob so that no one else could speak to her. Then she touched the lighting apparatus, and the little room was plunged into darkness. Be quick, she called, her irritation returning. Be quick, Kuno. Here I am in the dark, wasting my time. But it was fully 15 seconds before the round plate that she held in her hands began to glow. A faint blue light shot across it, darkening to purple, and presently she could see the image of her son, who lived on the other side of the earth, and he could see her. Kuno, how slow you are. He smiled gravely. I really believe you enjoy dawdling. I have called you before, Mother, but you are always busy or isolated. I have something particular to say. What is it, dearest boy? Be quick. Why could you not send it by pneumatic post? Because I prefer saying such a thing. I want... Well? I want you to come and see me. Vashti watched his face in the blue plate. But I can see you, she exclaimed. What more do you want? I want to see you not through the machine, said Kuno. I want to speak to you not through the wearisome machine. Oh, hush, said his mother, vaguely shocked. You mustn't say anything against the machine. Why not? One mustn't. You talk as if a god had made the machine, cried the other. I believe that you pray to it when you are unhappy. Men made it, do not forget that. 
Great men, but men. The machine is much, but it is not everything. I see something like you in this plate, but I do not see you. I hear something like you through this telephone, but I do not hear you. That is why I want you to come. Pay me a visit so that we can meet face to face and talk about the hopes that are in my mind. She replied that she could scarcely spare time for a visit. The airship barely takes two days to fly between me and you. I dislike airships. Why? I dislike seeing the horrible brown earth and the sea and the stars when it is dark. I get no ideas in an airship. I do not get them anywhere else. What kind of ideas can the air give you? He paused for an instant. Do you not know four big stars that form an oblong and three stars close together in the middle of the oblong and hanging from these stars three other stars? No, I do not. I dislike the stars. But did they give you an idea? How interesting. Tell me. I had an idea they were like a man. I do not understand. The four big stars are the man's shoulders and his knees. The three stars in the middle are like the belts that men once wore, and the three stars hanging are like a sword. A sword? Men carried swords about with them to kill animals and other men. It does not strike me as a very good idea, but it is certainly original. When did it come to you first? In the airship. He broke off, and she fancied that he looked sad. She could not be sure, for the machine did not transmit nuances of expression. It only gave a general idea of people, an idea that was good enough for all practical purposes, Vashti thought. The imponderable bloom, declared by a discredited philosophy to be the actual essence of intercourse, was rightly ignored by the machine, just as the imponderable bloom of the grape was ignored by the manufacturers of artificial fruit. Something good enough had long since been accepted by our race. The truth is, he continued, that I want to see these stars again. They're curious stars. I want to see them not from the airship, but from the surface of the earth, as our ancestors did thousands of years ago. I want to visit the surface of the earth. She was shocked again. Mother, you must come if only to explain to me what is the harm of visiting the surface of the earth. No harm, she replied, controlling herself, but no advantage. The surface of the earth is only dust and mud, no advantage. The surface of the earth is only dust and mud, no life remains on it, and you would need a respirator, or the cold of the outer air would kill you. One dies immediately in the outer air. I know. Of course, I shall take all precautions. And besides... Well? She considered and chose her words with care. Her son had a queer temper, and she wished to dissuade him from the expedition. It is contrary to the spirit of the age, she asserted. Do you mean by that contrary to the machine? In a sense, but... His image in the blue plate faded. Kuno! He had isolated himself. For a moment, Vashti felt lonely. Then she generated the light, and the sight of her room, flooded with radiance and studded with electric buttons, revived her. There were buttons and switches everywhere. Buttons to call for food, for music, for clothing. There was the hot bath button, by pressure of which a basin of imitation marble rose out of the floor, filled to the brim with a warm, deodorized liquid. There was the cold bath button. There was the button that produced literature. And there were, of course, the buttons by which she communicated with her friends. The room, though it contained nothing, was in touch with all that she cared for in the world. Vashti's next move was to turn off the isolation switch, and all the accumulations of the last three minutes burst upon her. You've got mail. The room was filled with the noise of bells and speaking tubes. What was the new food like? Could she recommend it? 
Has she had any ideas lately? Might one tell her one's own ideas? Would she make an engagement to visit the public nurseries at an early date, say this day, month? To most of these questions, she replied with irritation, a growing quality in that accelerated age. She said that the new food was horrible, that she could not visit the public nurseries through press of engagements, that she had no ideas of her own but had just been told one, that four stars and three in the middle were like a man. She doubted there was much in it. Then she switched off her correspondence for it was time to deliver her lecture on Australian music. The clumsy system of public gatherings had been long since abandoned. Neither Vashti nor her audience stirred from their rooms. Seated in her armchair, she spoke while they in their armchairs heard her fairly well and saw her fairly well. She opened with a humorous account of music in the pre-Mongolian epoch and went on to describe the great outbursts of song that followed the Chinese conquest. Remote and primeval as were the methods of Ai San so in the Brisbane school, she yet felt, she said, that study of them might repay the musicians of today. They had freshness. They had, above all, ideas. Her lecture, which lasted 10 minutes, was well received, and at its conclusion she and many of her audience listened to a lecture on the sea. There were ideas to be got from the sea. The speaker had donned a respirator and visited it lately. Then she fed, talked to many friends, had a bath, talked again, and summoned her bed. The bed was not to her liking. It was too large, and she had a feeling for a small bed. Complaint was useless, for beds were of the same dimension all over the world, and to have an alternative size would have involved vast alterations in the machine. Vashti isolated herself. It was necessary, for neither day nor night existed under the ground, and reviewed all that had happened since she summoned the bed last. Ideas? Scarcely any. Events? Was Kuno's invitation an event? By her side on the little reading desk was a survival from the ages of litter. One book. This was the book of the machine. In it were instructions against every possible contingency. If she was hot or cold or deceptic or at a loss for a word, she went to the book. And it told her which button to press. The Central Committee published it. In accordance with the growing habit, it was richly bound. Sitting up in bed, she took it reverently in her hands. She glanced round the glowing room as if someone might be watching her. Then, half ashamed, half joyful, she murmured, Oh, machine, oh, machine, and raised the volume to her lips. Thrice she kissed it, thrice inclined her head, thrice she felt the delirium of acquiescence. Her ritual performed, she turned to page 1,367, which gave the times of the departure of the airships from the island in the southern hemisphere, under whose soil she lived, to the island in the northern hemisphere, where under lived her son. She thought, I have not the time. She made the room dark and slept. She awoke and made the room light. She ate and exchanged ideas with her friends and listened to music and attended lectures. She made the room dark and slept. Above her, beneath her, and around her, the machine hummed eternally. She did not notice the noise, for she had been born with it in her ears. The earth carrying her hummed as it sped through silence, turning her now to the invisible sun, now to the invisible stars. She awoke and made the room light. Kuno! I will not talk to you. He answered, until you come. Have you been on the surface of the earth since we spoke last? His image faded. Again, she consulted the book. She became very nervous and lay back in her chair palpitating. Think of her as without teeth or hair. Presently, she directed the chair to the wall and pressed an unfamiliar button. The wall swung apart slowly 
Through the opening, she saw a tunnel that curved slightly so that its goal was not visible. Should she go to see her son, here was the beginning of her journey. Of course, she knew about the communication system. There was nothing mysterious in it. She would summon a car and it would fly with her down the tunnel until it reached the lift that communicated with the airship station. The system had been in service for many, many years, long before the universal establishment of the machine. And of course, she had studied the civilization that had immediately preceded her own. The civilization that had mistaken the functions of the system and had used it for bringing people to things instead of for bringing things to people. Those funny old days where men went for change of air instead of changing the air in their rooms. And yet, she was frightened of the tunnel. She had not seen it since her last child was born. It curved, but not quite as she remembered. It was brilliant, but not quite as brilliant as a lecturer had suggested. Vashti was seized with the terrors of direct experience. She shrank back into the room, and the wall closed up again. Kuno, she said. I cannot come to you. I am not well. Immediately, an enormous apparatus fell onto her out of the ceiling. A thermometer was automatically laid upon her heart. She lay powerless. Cool pads soothed her forehead. Kuno had telegraphed to her doctor. So the human passion still blundered up and down in the machine. Vashti drank the medicine that the doctor projected into her mouth, and the machinery retired into the ceiling. The voice of Kuno was heard asking how she felt. Better, then with irritation. But why do you not come see me instead? Because I cannot leave this place. Why? Because at any moment, something tremendous may happen. Have you been on the surface of the earth yet? Not yet. Then what is it? I will not tell you through the machine. She resumed her life, but she thought of Kuno as a baby. His birth, his removal to the public nurseries, her own visit to him there, his visits to her, visits which stopped when the machine had assigned him a room on the other side of the earth. Parents, duties of, said the book of the machine, cease at the moment of birth. P42232743. True, but there was something special about Kuno. Indeed, there had been something special about all her children. And, after all, she must brave the journey if he desired it. And something tremendous might happen. What did that mean? The nonsense of a youthful man, no doubt, but she must go. Again, she pressed the unfamiliar button. Again, the wall swung back, and she saw the tunnel that curves out of sight. Clasping the book, she rose, tottered onto the platform, and summoned the car. Her room closed behind her. The journey to the Northern Hemisphere had begun. Of course, it was perfectly easy. The car approached, and in it she found armchairs exactly like her own. When she signaled, it stopped, and she tottered into the lift. One other passenger was in the lift, the first fellow creature she had seen face to face for months. Few traveled in these days, for, thanks to the advance of science, the Earth was exactly alike all over. Rapid intercourse, from which the previous civilization had hoped so much, had ended by defeating itself. What was the good of going to Peking when it was just like Shrewsbury? Why return to Shrewsbury when it would all be like Peking? Men seldom moved their bodies. All unrest was concentrated in the soul. The airship service was a relic from the former age. It was kept up because it was easier to keep it up than to stop it or diminish it, but it now far exceeded the wants of the population. Vessel after vessel would rise up from the vomitories of Rye or Christchurch, I use the antique names, would sail into the crowded sky and would draw up at the wharves of the south, empty. So nicely adjusted was the system, so independent of meteorology, that the sky, whether calm or cloudy, 
resembled a vast kaleidoscope whereon the same patterns periodically reoccurred. The ship on which Vasti sailed started now at sunset, now at dawn, but always as it passed above Reyes it would neighbor the ship that served between Helsingfors and the Brazils, and every third time it surmounted the Alps the fleet of Palermo would cross its track behind. Night and day, wind and storm, tide and earthquake impeded man no longer. He had harnessed Leviathan. All the old literature, with its praise of nature and its fear of nature, rang false as the prattle of a child. Yet, as Vashti saw the vast flank of the ship, stained with exposure to the outer air, her horror of direct experience returned. It was not quite like the airship in the cinema photo. For one thing, it smelled, not strongly or unpleasantly, but it did smell and with her eyes shut she should have known that a new thing was close to her. Then she had to walk to it from the lift, had to submit to glances from other passengers. The man in front dropped his book. No great matter, but it disquieted them all. In the rooms, if the book was dropped, the floor raised it mechanically, but the gangway to the ship was not so prepared, and the sacred volume lay motionless. They stopped. The thing was unforeseen. And the man, instead of picking up his property, felt the muscles of his arm to see how they had failed him. Then someone actually said with direct utterance, We shall be late, and they tripped on board, Vashti treading on the pages as she did so. Inside, her anxiety increased. The arrangements were old-fashioned and rough. There was even a female attendant to whom she would have to announce her wants during the voyage. Of course, a revolving platform ran the length of the boat, but she was expected to walk from it to her cabin. Some cabins were better than others, and she did not get the best. She thought the attendant had been unfair, and spasms of rage shook her. The glass valves had closed. She could not go back. She saw, at the end of the vestibule, the lift in which she had ascended going quietly up and down, empty. Beneath those corridors of shining tiles were rooms, tier below tier, reaching far into the earth and in each room there sat a human being, eating or sleeping or producing ideas, and buried deep in the hive was her own room. Vashti was afraid. Oh, machine, she murmured, and caressed her book, and was comforted. Then the sides of the vestibule seemed to melt together, as do the passages that we see in dreams. The lift vanished. The book that had been dropped slid to the left and vanished. Polished tiles rushed by like a stream of water. There was a slight jar, and the airship, issuing from its tunnels, soared above the waters of a tropical ocean. It was night. For a moment, she saw the coast of Sumatra edged by the phosphorescence of waves and crowned by lighthouses, still sending forth their disregarded beams. These also vanished, and only the stars distracted her. They were not motionless, but swayed to and fro above her head, thronging out of one skylight into another, as if the universe and not the airship was careening. And, as often happens on clear nights, they seem now to be in perspective, now in a plane, now piled tier beyond tier into the infinite heavens, now concealing infinity, a roof limiting forever the visions of men. In either case, they seemed intolerable. Are we to travel in the dark? Called the passengers angrily, and the attendant, who had been careless, generated the light and pulled down the blinds of pliable metal. When the airships had been built, the desire to look direct at things still lingered in the world. Hence the extraordinary number of skylights and windows, and the proportionate discomfort to those who were civilized and refined. Even in Vashti's cabin, one star peeped through a flaw in the blind, and after a few hours' uneasy slumber, she was disturbed by an unfamiliar glow, which was the dawn. Quick as the ship had sped westwards, the earth had rolled eastwards quicker still, and had dragged back Vashti and her companions towards the sun. Science could prolong the night, but only for a little. 
and those high hopes of neutralizing the Earth's diurnal revolution had passed, together with hopes that were possibly higher. To keep pace with the sun, or even to outstrip it, had been the aim of the civilization preceding this. Racing aeroplanes had been built for the purpose, capable of enormous speed, and steered by the greatest intellects of the epoch. Round the globe they went, round and round, westward, westward, round and round, amidst humanity's applause. In vain. The globe went eastward quicker still. Horrible accidents occurred, and the Committee of the Machine, at the time rising into prominence, declared the pursuit illegal, unmechanical, and punishable by homelessness. Of homelessness, more will be said later. Doubtless, the Committee was right. Yet the attempt to defeat the sun aroused the last common interest that our race experienced about the heavenly bodies, or indeed about anything. It was the last time that men were compacted by thinking of a power outside the world. The sun had conquered, yet it was the end of his spiritual dominion. Dawn, midday, twilight, the zodiacal path touched neither men's lives nor their hearts, and science retreated into the ground to concentrate herself upon problems that she was certain of solving. So when Vashti found her cabin invaded by a rosy finger of light, she was annoyed and tried to adjust the blind. But the blind flew up altogether, and she saw through the skylight small pink clouds swaying against a background of blue. And as the sun crept higher, its radiance entered direct, brimming down the wall like a golden sea. It rose and fell with the airship's motion, just as waves rise and fall, but it advanced steadily as a tide advances. Unless she was careful, it would strike her face. A spasm of horror shook her and she rang for the attendant. The attendant too was horrified, but she could do nothing. It was not her place to mend the blind. She could only suggest that the lady should change her cabin, which she accordingly prepared to do. People were almost exactly alike all over the world, but the attendant of the airship, perhaps owing to her exceptional duties, had grown a little out of the common. She had often to address passengers with direct speech and this had given her a certain roughness and originality of manner. When Vashti swerved away from the sunbeams with a cry, she behaved barbarically. She put out a hand to steady her. How dare you, exclaimed the passenger. You forget yourself. The woman was confused and apologized for not having let her fall. People never touched one another. The custom had become obsolete, owing to the machine. Where are we now? asked Vashti haughtily. We are over Asia, said the attendant, anxious to be polite. Asia? Uh, you must excuse my common way of speaking. I have gotten to the habit of calling places over which I pass by their unmechanical names. Oh, I remember Asia. The Mongols came from it. Beneath us, in the open air, stood a city that was once called Simla. Have you ever heard of the Mongols in the Brisbane school? No. Brisbane also stood in the open air. Those mountains to the right? Let me show you them. She pushed back a metal blind. The main chain of the Himalayas was revealed. They were once called the roof of the world, those mountains. You must remember that before the dawn of civilization, they seemed to be an impenetrable wall that touched the stars. It was supposed that no one but the gods could exist above their summits. How we have advanced thanks to the machine. How we have advanced thanks to the machine, said Vashti. How we have advanced thanks to the machine, echoed the passenger who had dropped his book the night before and who was standing in the passage. And that white stuff in the cracks, what is it? I have forgotten its name. Cover the window, please. These mountains give me no ideas. The northern aspect of the Himalayas was in deep shadow. On the Indian slope, the sun had just prevailed. The forest had been destroyed during the literature epoch for the purpose of making newspaper pulp but the snows were awakening to their morning glory, and the clouds still hung on the breast of Kinchinjunga. In the plain were seen the ruins of cities, with diminished rivers creeping by their walls, and by the sides of these were sometimes the signs of vomitories marking the cities of today. Over the whole prospect, airships rushed, crossing the inner crossing with incredible aplomb, 
and rising nonchalantly when they desired to escape the perturbations of the lower atmosphere and to traverse to the roof of the world. We have indeed advanced, thanks to the machine, repeated the attendant, and hid the Himalayas behind a metal blind. The day dragged wearily forward. The passengers sat each in his cabin, avoiding one another with an almost physical repulsion and longing to be once more under the surface of the earth. There were eight or ten of them, mostly young males, sent out from the public nurseries to inhabit the rooms of those who had died in various parts of the earth. The man who had dropped his book was on the homeward journey. He had been sent to Sumatra for the purpose of propagating the race. Vashti alone was traveling by her private will. At midday, she took a second glance at the earth. The airship was crossing another range of mountains, but she could see little, owing to clouds. Masses of black rock hovered below her and merged indistinctly into gray. Their shapes were fantastic. One of them resembled a prostate man. No ideas here, murmured Vashti, and hid the Caucasus behind a metal blind. In the evening, she looked again. They were crossing a golden sea in which lay many small islands in one peninsula. She repeated, no ideas here, and hid Greece behind a metal blind. Of Now and Then is produced, recorded, and edited by Aram Vartian in the city of Chicago. Special thanks to BattleBards for their unparalleled catalog of sound effects. Check them out at BattleBards.com. For updates about this show and future episodes, follow me on Twitter at of now and then. If you would like to support the show, there are links to our Patreon and official t-shirts at ofnowandthen.com. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you next week for more stories from Of Now and Then.